Matt Elkin, Yale Director of Basketball Operations. Um, Matt, it's been really cool just over the last, I guess, like, honestly, six months, a year or so is when we finally, like, met in person. I feel like I'd seen you all over Twitter, all over social, um, pretty much everywhere. And if there's a basketball clinic, if there's a Zoom, like, Matt's there. So I had seen your name, and I don't even remember how we actually got connected, but obviously Sam on the women's side I played with. Um, Sam Guastella, and I know you guys have become friends, so kind of kind of mutual friends and it's worked out. So it's been nice to actually get to know you outside of basketball, but I was excited to be able to obviously talk to you. You've had so many different stops um, and you're still super young, which is incredible. Um, starting at Wisconsin, which I did not know, manager at Wisconsin. So I'm just excited to kind of hear about your coaching journey so far, kind of your day-to-day now as, an ops, as the ops guy at Yale. So just starting off, how do you think um, being at so many different stops has kind of added value to your life and given you so many different perspectives um, up until this point. Like, what would you say for younger coaches who maybe have opportunities to make moves early in their career but might be a little nervous about it? Um, how has that kind of benefited you so far? Yeah, well, first of all, appreciate you having me here. And it's really nice to talk with you. And uh, it goes both ways. Like, all the stuff that you've been doing is really cool, too. So, um, to get to be a part of it in, in any small way is, is a privilege of mine. So I'm excited to chat with you. And, um, you know, my journey is like everybody's is unique to me. Um, and I think it's, it's has speaks to who I am and things that I'm comfortable with and also things that I'm uncomfortable with, but learning to live in that uncomfort zone to, mm-hmm. to help me be better. And so, um, you know, growing up, I grew up in Boston. Um, I went to a really good public school um, where, you know, in in a city like Boston, there's so many options for college. Um, But I grew up in a home where my dad and my brother both went to University of Wisconsin. So I kind of grew up being like a Badger fan for sports and had visited my older brother. And so like, for me, if I could go there and have the opportunity to be a student there outside of anything within basketball, that was like kind of my focus and my dream. So when I got in there, um, I then decided, okay, I'm done playing high school basketball. I'm not going to be playing for the Badgers, unfortunately. Um, So what can I do to stay involved in the game? So that's how I got started as a student manager there. Um, And while uh, I was in school in at UW, I also had an opportunity to work at a division three school, which was um, in Madison as well called Edgewood College. And so I had an opportunity to be a student manager for the Badgers. Um, my sophomore season or my sophomore year at UW um, and then heading into my junior year uh, they had a, a new coach take over at Edgewood um, I was looking for an opportunity to get more involved in like coaching side of it like student assistant coaching gotcha. um, and so I had an opportunity to transition into doing some more um, student assistant coaching team managing all different stuff mixed into one at the division three level while I was still uh, in school at, at UW Madison so even within my college experience of four years, I had an opportunity to be a division one big 10 student manager on a large crew. I think we had about 16 student managers at the time to then being one manager, one student assistant at a small D three school. So just that alone to your question was incredible. It made me um, have to try things I never tried before, be very uncomfortable, but I learned a lot about what I liked, what I didn't like, um, what I was good at, what I needed to improve on. So that was just in my college experience, incredible. And then um, yeah. had a chance to come back home uh, to Boston, was a graduate assistant um, at Northeastern University um, and was there for two for two years, got my master's degree in sports leadership um, and then kind of hit a pivot point in my career where, you know, you graduate, what's next? You know, I, I don't, I'm trying to find jobs. I'm trying to get into division one, stay into division one. And um, it wasn't working as we all know, it's how competitive it is. So, um, you know, I got recommended by somebody I'd worked with at Northeastern to go into the prep school route. And so I ended up spending um, those next two years at Vermont Academy prep school. And then the, the mm-hmm. two years after that, I moved to Los Angeles and I was coaching high school basketball in LA and doing some stuff with AAU and events. So many and- different stops, so many places so early. Right. Yeah, it's it's um, it was really nuts. But yeah. um, for me, again, back to what I opened with, like for me, it was great because I'm somebody who I can go into a gym where I don't know anybody and make friends. I can go to an environment where I don't know people and navigate seamlessly, whether it's I'm staying in my lane and just kind of 
doing what I need to do or from going out there and meeting people and, you know, trying to really jump in head first. So I felt very comfortable leaving Boston to go to college in the Midwest where I didn't know anybody. I felt very comfortable leaving um, the city life of Boston, what I was very familiar with to go to Vermont and live in the middle of nowhere at a boarding school. Um, and then I was felt comfortable again, all different ways, but felt comfortable moving to LA to have that opportunity to go out there and all of those things put together, you know, put me in the position I am now. How much would you say that the division one managing experience along with the division three student assistant experience helped you help prepare you for Northeastern being the GA there, having a little bit of basketball and then obviously the managing role itself. Um, I'm not sure what that looked like at Wisconsin um, early in your, in your college career there, but how much did having that experience kind of really prepare you to be, to be that GA at Northeastern? And what did your kind of, what, what did your role um, kind of look like at Northeastern? Yeah. So, I mean, I think the, the biggest thing I learned from my college experience was that um, as we are figuring out where we want to be, like we all have dreams and aspirations in coaching, we forget sometimes that we're still growing and, and evolving as people. And especially when you're in college, right. like, the 18 year old Matt Elkin was way different than the 22 year old Matt Elkin. And so I think as I was learning about just what the game is and what it's like to work and not be a player anymore and be a student, but, you know, be kind of more on closer to being a career and a job versus, yep. you know, a, a player, like you're learning about what that entails while you're also learning about me. Like, am I the type of person that can, you know, wake up super early in the morning and stay up super late at night in the office? Am I somebody that likes to be on the floor or somebody that likes to be doing admin operation stuff? Am I somebody that is going to, you know, build relationships with all of our coaches or just latch on to one assistant and kind of tack on with them? And so like you learn all these things about who you are and what works for you and what doesn't work. And so I think that's the biggest lesson I learned going from a big time program where I was a small piece in a large organization yep. to then being, you know, a bigger piece in a much smaller organization and really just learned like what I'm good at, what I need to work on. And then also just the vast array of different things that come onto people's plates, like the assistant coaches, the players, the people that are involved around the program administration, like at between those two experiences, um, as I'm growing and evolving in my coaching career and who I am, like I'm learning that you really got to be willing to do anything and everything at all times. And so when I became a GA, um, you know, I actually started, I, I was a volunteer at Northeastern. So I yep. basically was in grad school. I applied to grad school on my own. I, I happened to live close enough to this campus where I could stay at home. And I said, listen, you guys are not going to have to worry about me making it work with school, with right. finding a job with housing. I'm going to make it work. Don't worry about me. I just want to be involved. And so I showed up on the first day and, you know, it wasn't a position that they had had in the past. It was something right. that I was kind of like, Hey, I just want to help out. And so, you know, they were probably thinking, all right, this guy's going to come in and, of you know, course, couple anyone days that's willing, willing to help. And yeah. 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 So, so when I showed up the first day, you know, at, at six in the morning and was like sitting outside, cause I didn't even have a key to the <laughs> office and I'm just like chilling. And they're like, Matt, what are you doing? I'm like, what do you mean? I'm I'm ready to work. Like, let's go. So, you know, I, I think all of those experiences that I had put, put me into that spot to say, I understand what it's going to take to, to make it here. And if coach needs me to go rebound, even though I'm doing something on my computer for some other coach, I got to right. be able to say, Hey, coach needs me to go rebound. I got to go rebound for this guy, or they need me to go track down this player because he forgot to fill out some paperwork. I got to go do that and be able to start learning how to prioritize things amongst within the coaching staff. And then also navigating the dynamics of, okay, now you're not in college anymore. You're in grad school. You're still close enough in age to some of these players where, you know, you might run into them and in, in, in a nighttime activity right. or something, but you're trying to move in the direction of being one of the coaches. So now you're learning how to navigate those dynamics of, you know, on the one side, you have players giving you information on the other side, you have coaches giving you information, and then you got to kind of jumble it all together and figure out what goes back this way, which goes back that way, what stays here. So um, I think all my experiences in college helped me kind of learn how to decipher that information and how to just really be a jack of all trades to become a really successful GA. Yeah. And you just touched on the work ethic piece of just being willing to, you know, do anything essentially 
is that kind of your, was that your first step in terms of earning trust? Um, and would you recommend that? So someone who's, you know, right out of high school, right out of college, either wanting to be a manager, maybe they're already a manager looking for GA spots of earning trust of a new staff. So, you know, they, they were maybe a, a manager for four years somewhere, and now they've got to go to a new spot where things aren't familiar. Um, obviously, I think the work ethic piece at this point is, is required. Like that should just be something that's not even, that's unspoken, right? That's going to that's gonna happen. How else would you recommend that, that kids at this point um, really earn that trust from a coaching staff? And then how do they receive feedback? So were you somebody that would go in, you know, after a month, maybe working somewhere, Hey, like, how am I doing? How do you kind of figure, think that people should evaluate themselves and get, get feedback from their staff without being, you know, a little bit too much and over the top. Yeah, those are, those are both great questions. Um, I think the first part about earning the trust, you know, you have to earn, you know, there's different ways to go about doing it. And so for me, when I got to Northeastern, it was because I had met one of our associate head coach at the time was actually now the head coach at Dartmouth coach Dave McLaughlin and gotcha. um, became a big mentor of mine. And I spent the first couple months in the corner of his office, mm -hmm. like just basically doing anything he needed me to do. And then I branched out and started to do other things for other people. But right. I think the the trust gets developed by your work ethic and your work habits, right? So it's, it is, it is kind of the baseline Like you have to work hard to be successful, yes. but there are, you and I, I'm sure both know there's lots of people that don't work hard and they don't become successful, but the ones that do work hard. Okay. Now that's your new baseline. And every time you set the baseline for yourself, it rises, it rises. So the expectation again, is if I'm going to be the first one in the office, I'm, I'm nobody asked me to do that, but on the day when I'm not the first one in the office, somebody's be like, oh, where's Matt today? Like, so you right. set you set the bar for yourself higher and higher and you have to be willing to live up to those expectations. I think that's how you build trust. When somebody gives you a task to do, you, you execute it, you either do it exactly the way they ask you to do, or you do it and maybe elevate it in a little bit ways here and there. And then they're like, wow, okay, this is what I asked Matt to do. And this is what he gave me. Like, this is pretty impressive. I'm going to give him something else and, and build trust that way. Yeah. So that's, that's a great way to do it within your coaching staff, understanding what their needs are. Again, like I said before, like one of my biggest values was just to be able to be available to rebound for guys. If guys right. wanted to shoot and a coach was doing something else, like they could just say, Matt, all right, can you go rebound for him? And me always being there, my availability was just, yeah, I'm going to go work out with the guys. And they knew for 30 minutes, you know, Mike was going to get 200 shots up, 300 shots up because Matt was there rebounding instead of them going on the gun or, you know, yeah. whatever. So that, that helped me build trust with, with our coaching staff, but also with the players. And I think honestly, as a manager, but also as a graduate assistant, especially building the relationship and the rapport and the trust with the players is probably more important than any relationship you have with the coaches, because the coaches are going to see that now, instead of me player coming in to ask, Hey, can anybody rebound for me and me jumping out? It's like, now they're just texting me. Right. And that, and they're like, Oh, I'm the, Hey coach, I'll be right back. I'm going to go rebound for Jen or I'm going to go rebound for, you know, and they're like, Oh, okay, cool. Like, and now they just see that I'm always in the gym. Right. And then they, the player, they see me interacting with the players, whether you're on the road or at home and that they confide in you in certain things. And, and now they know, okay, this, this guy is building strong relationships with the players. And ultimately that's what it's all about keeping people happy especially nowadays with with how things are working in college basketball like if you can yeah. have a pulse on your team who's happy who's not who's going through issues with their significant others who's struggling in schools having problems at home you know who, whatever the case may be if if you can be the main person that has a pulse on that stuff it's a lot easier to then connect the coaching staff to their players yeah. right and and so now i don't have to as a head coach or an assistant i don't need to have meetings with every single one of my guys all the time I can have maybe a daily check-in and say hey coach good morning you need anything today here's a couple of things I'm working on you know um you know just a reminder you know um Sean has that class today so he's going to be late for practice you know he'll be there at whatever time and so you just kind of again going back and forth between the players and coaches yeah, no, that's, that's a really good point. And uh, continuing on to the point of the work ethic piece of, you know, being the first person in last person out, right. It also kind of, it's the contradiction between that being in the office, working hard, putting in the hours, but also being efficient. 
Um, and how have you kind of grown maybe early in your career? You know, it's, there's, there's quite a few people that I believe probably show up really early, stay really late, but there's not that much getting done during that time. And someone who maybe stays in the office half, half as long is getting twice as much work done. And I'm sure you've seen both sides of that throughout your career so far. How have you kind of balanced um, both of those things um, at your different stops? And I'm sure you're way better now at being efficient like we all are as we go on through our career. And maybe that kind of leads into the organization um, piece that I definitely want to touch on with you. Obviously being ops, you got to be organized. So can you touch on the balance of work ethic, efficiency, and organization? Yeah. And and on, to be honest, it's not something that I've perfected. Um, you know, I think it just, your style as a young coach, I think as a GA, a manager, operations, whatever, your style and who you are has to, at, at some level, um, accommodate to those around you, right? So like, for right. example, when I was at Northeastern, Coach McLaughlin would come in, I knew he would come in very early before work to work out. So for me, it was important to be there, whether or not he just dropped his bag off and went, but I wanted him to see that I was there. And then, you know, to be honest, a lot of times he would go work out and I'd like be on, you know, watching videos or, you know, doing You're something there. else. Not, yep. Yeah, like I'm but I'm there because, again, like if he needed something and I'm there, I'm doing it. If he doesn't need anything, great. But at least I'm here. Right. And I think that's like your, yeah. your best ability is availability. Right. Everybody says that. So like just being there is half the battle. So but here at Yale, for example, like our coaches have to have to take their kids to school or are doing other things in the morning. So like some people might not come in till eight or nine o'clock. Right. So yeah. even though I'm here at eight, nobody might come in until nine o'clock that day or 10 o'clock that or whatever, but at least I'm here. Right. And then if, if an email comes through, I'm ready to answer it. Or, you know, that's my time. I can follow up on watch some of your, your YouTube videos, you know, whatever, <laughs> whatever I have extra time to do. Right. So um, I use that time as my, as my time, but, you know, I think other people are built differently. Like I'm very much a morning person more yeah. than a late night person. Like, so it's once I'm up, I'm up and I'm productive right from the jump. So um, it doesn't, it doesn't take me a lot of time to get in the morning and shake off the cobwebs and like, you know, right. warm myself up. Like I'm ready to go and I get a lot of work done in the morning. Um, later at night, it's like, I'm kind of winding down and I'm, you know, I'd rather, kick back and go home and watch a game or, you know, send some texts or make calls. But like, I'm, I'm trying to slowly like ramp it down at the night. Some people are the exact opposite. Yeah. Some people are night owls. And, you know, one thing I've had to learn Jen too, is like, especially because of my time spent on the West coast, like I have to adjust my clock now too, be, to the point where like certain days a week, I'm saying like, I'm going to stay up late tonight because I'm going to connect with some people back three hours earlier. So, you know, I'm up until midnight, one o'clock because I'm trying to connect with people that are yeah. on West coast time. That so, sense, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm trying to navigate that as well. Um, but, you know, I think to your question about efficiency, like you just got to figure out what works well for you. Like certain people, um, you know, I've, I've become more confident in being able to ask people, like if my head coach asked me something, Hey Matt, can you put this graphic together for me? Can you put a presentation together? You know, I feel more comfortable now being like, oh, coach, when do you need this by? Or when, you know, what's, how pressing is this? Is this something you need by the end of today? Can I get it to you tomorrow? Is it something that you're just thinking of and I can get it to you next week? Because I want to, I don't want to feel like super stressed out that I have eight different things to do and I need to do them all right now. I'd rather right. be able to make my to-do list and prioritize things. So as a young coach, I didn't feel confident to do that because I'm just like, to ask I'm the question. Gonna, that's yeah. so, that's such a good point. Like, I didn't, I've never even thought about that. Of just, and you're just like, yeah. oh, somebody says, go do it, do it right now. Right. And then if one person says, so I'm like going to rebound and then it's like, hey, Matt, I need you. And then you're like going this and then you're back and forth and you're like yeah. glitching, you know? So, <laughs> so I think to be yeah. able to have the confidence in yourself and in the people you work with to know, hey, um, can I, is this something I can do tomorrow or tonight? Cause I'm working on this right now. And you know, if they say, no, I need it done now. It's like, all right, great. I'll bump the other stuff down. So I think that kind of ties in. I didn't get a chance to answer your question before about feedback, but like ties into that a little oh, bit yes. to be able to have that working relationship with somebody where you can get feedback, you can ask them, you can feel comfortable saying, Hey, is this how you wanted this? Is this not how you like it? This is how I do things. Is this a way that you can digest it? If not, I'll do it this way, you know, and, and just being able to have that communication. With every head coach that you've worked for, have you, when you first got there, kind of 
observed maybe for the first couple of weeks and just kind of taking it in. Okay. This is how he works. You're saying like Dave McLaughlin was in early, like maybe everywhere you've been is a little bit different. Have you kind of taken those first couple of weeks to kind of just get a feel or have you been more aggressive about being like, Hey, how do you want this right away? Just from the aspect of being new somewhere. How have you kind of taken those first couple of weeks of learning kind of what the culture is and what uh, the expectations are? Yeah. I mean, I think um, it's a little bit of a balance. It's certain things I'm super curious about how they get done. So I want to know. So I'm going to ask um, other things. I'm just going to sit back and like, for example, here at Yale, when we have staff meetings, we have a staff meeting every morning, you know, I'm not speaking for the first year and a half that I'm working here. <laughs> I'm just listening to the other guys speak and interact. And if somebody asks me a question, I respond, but I'm not like, chirping in and trying to be like an equal part in this. I'm really just trying to observe and, gotcha. you know, add value where I can. Right. And then as time goes on, you feel a little more confident and understanding how the dynamics work within your office space. Um, same thing with, with our head coach, you know, different head coaches that I've worked for um, again, some of them value certain things over others. And so you learn about that through observation, you learn about that through asking, but you also, you know, there's ways for me to ask, you know, our assistant, Hey, is this, we're, we're going to take a road, like the first, for example, here's a good example. When we were planning travel for the Ivy league, we play back to back, right? Play, play like yeah. Friday, Saturday. So my first year at Yale was the COVID year. So we didn't have a season that whole year. So I had gone, I had never um, done a road trip itinerary or anything like that before. So the first year, instead of, you know, I'd gotten taking some lumps about me asking coach too many questions, right. When I didn't like, <laughs> so, so I'm like, all right, I'm not going to bother him with this. I'm just going to ask our associate head coach because he's been here almost as long as coach and he knows exactly how, you know, how we like to do it. So gotcha. I'm going to then just ask him, Hey, when we travel, you know, to uh, Harvard and Dartmouth, where, where does coach usually like to stay? Where, you know, does, do we like to practice here or practice here? Like ask him these questions. He gives me that answer. Or he might say, Matt, just go ask coach. Like he'll want it done a certain way. So again, that goes into that communication, but, um, you know, you observe a little bit, you ask a little bit, um, you know, you pick the brains of the people that have been in your position prior to you, um, you know, Hey, how is this, how you guys usually did things? This is how I did stuff in my last place. Is this how you guys did it? You do it yeah. differently. Great. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, you just want to do the best job you can and mistakes, especially when you're new are part of it. And that's how you learn and you got to be able to learn from those mistakes and move forward. That's so good, especially, I mean, for first time ops, first year, second year, like that, that's an, it's an intimidating job. I'd argue more so than coaching because basketball is basketball at the end of the day. Like, but the operation side of things, like, like you said, every coach wants stuff done differently, or they've been doing it for a long time, or it's a new staff and everything's brand new. So it's even, there's even more discussion probably about the way that things should be getting done. So that's, that's really good. So going back to, you said that you're a morning guy. Can you take us through what a day in the life would look like maybe in season busiest time, maybe you're uh, early in the week, but you know, you're going on a road trip this an upcoming weekend. And then maybe now kind of what your day looks like if it's more relaxed, I know it never really slows down, but it's a different type of busy, I'm sure. So kind of like an abbreviated uh, day in the life for you. I'm always curious as to like people's habits and, you know, what are some things that you're doing, making sure you do every single day, um, you know, and just being well-rounded. Yep. Um, so in season, like early in the week when we have a road trip coming up, let's just say I'm going to try to wake up. Um, I wake up usually pretty early or early for me, I guess, um, usually around 530 or six, try to get a workout in for like at least an hour if I can, if I have time for that. So let's say like, let's just say six to seven working out, shower, get ready, try to be in the office by, you know, like 730 to eight. Right. And then other people so will start usually coming in around nine ish. So from eight to nine is my time. So I'm either answering emails. Um, you know, big thing for me, Jen, is like, because I was coaching in um, high school for the last four years, I helped a lot of my athletes send emails and reach out to coaches to try to help be proactive in their recruiting. So a big thing for me is I make sure the hundreds of emails that we receive from players, I make sure I respond to every single person. Um, so I get emails directly. I get emails forwarded me from our other coaches. So sometimes just the emails from recruits or players that want to mm -hmm. come to Yale can take up my entire day. So I'm usually responding to each and every one of those emails. Um, that can take a while. Uh, it could be, you know, reading a newsletter, you know, 
um, listen to a podcast, something, watching video, catching up on the news, could be sports related, not sports. So eight to nine is usually my time. Again, whether it's stuff I need to catch up on or things that I'm just, you know, getting yeah, out yeah. of the way for the day. So then nine o'clock usually comes, um, coaches start coming in the office. It's checking in with them if there's anything they need. We have a staff meeting every morning about 10 o'clock. Um, that's where we'll talk about the plan for the day, any updates about what's going on, um, practice, talk about practice for that day, road trip questions, anything like that. Um, and then I'll usually be for the rest of the day um, kind of confirming all the details for that weekend's trip. So making sure the hotel has everything they need, making sure we know when our meals are going to be, the rooming assignments, um, double, triple, quadruple checking, um, everything is going to be good, smooth, the bus, if it's a flight, you know, airline stuff, uh, making sure we have a practice time if we're on the road, um, could be internal conversations like, hey, we're, we're, we were supposed to leave at three, but we're actually going to leave at 12. So can we practice at this time? Checking in with the volleyball coaches, women's basketball coaches, just trying to coordinate stuff like that. Um, so again, that can be one email, that could be 10 emails, depending on how behind or ahead I am, I try to stay ahead of on top of my my stuff, um, you know, lunch, lunch break in there somewhere, grab some food. Um, mm -hmm. And then we usually practice every day from in about four to seven time window. We don't go for three hours, but um, that's usually guys are usually done with class around 3.30 to four. So we usually practice sometime four to 4.30 start and then depending on where we are in the season. So in that window um, and then at practice itself, you know, I'm not on the floor. So I'm supporting our managers to make sure that they're kind of in charge, understanding what they need to do. Um, I could be running the clock. I could be, um, if we have people visiting that day, I might be hosting, you know, right. checking in, making sure people are good, you know, whatever. And then just watching and trying to learn as much as I can and, you know, give our guys little bits here and there whenever it's, it's possible, but letting our coaches coach and letting me, you know, be on the sideline. So then after practice every day, um, we film all of our practices. So yeah. one thing that I do is um, coaches might ask me to break some something down from practice or I take stats from all of our practice. So rather than trying to scramble and we, you know, for us, we, we have maybe one or two managers at practice. So we don't have like at Wisconsin, we had a, an army of managers oh, yes, that could take squad. stats yeah. and, yeah. you know, right. Break film down. So for me, it's a lot of coaches and myself do our own work. So I'm taking stats and I keep a spreadsheet with cumulative stats throughout um, the season of practice, because obviously we practice, you know, probably about three times as many practices as we actually play games. I think we usually right. get about a hundred practices in or so, and we only play about 30 games. So, um, so I'm putting, doing stats um, for the practice and then I'll send it to the coaches that night um, just so they can have a snapshot of how things look to practice. Um, and then it's a lot of the same stuff that I kind of started my day with. It could be catching up on some more emails. It could be, you know, reading some articles of some things that I had kind of tabbed for, for later. Um, and then, you know, a big thing for me just throughout my life career and, and day to day is my networking and my relationships, um, building new relationships, um, strengthening existing relationships. And so, you know, throughout the course of the day, I could have random texts from people, it could be phone calls, it could be um, people wanting to know about our summer camps, it could be people wanting to talk about scheduling, it could be yeah. a, a million different things. And so it's me making sure that I'm trying to con conduct myself and, and communicate with people in an efficient way, effective way, um, to try to, you know, move my career forward and my relationships, but also on behalf of Yale and our and our program so um there's a ton of stuff that's like kind of a brief yeah. no I want to jump in I want to jump in Matt on the the piece of you doing stats during practice um how do you feel like Dobos can stay involved on the basketball side of things if that's really like the itch they're trying to scratch right I know that there's some operations that that's where they want to stay they absolutely love it and they don't necessarily want to have anything to do with the basketball side. Um, being a basketball junkie yourself, and I know you're aspiring to be an assistant and eventually a head coach one day, how could you recommend that ops people stay involved in basketball so that they're still able to grow without directly being on the floor? I know the rules could be changing here. I believe mm -hmm. there was proposed, but um, without kind of stepping over that line too. Um, have you kind of found some ways to kind of be able to do both maybe outside of just having to watch videos on your own, even though that's probably a big part of it? Yeah, well, that that's, 
I mean, I, that's the most obvious way I would say is like, yeah. as much as you can, um, watch practice, rewatch right. it. Don't just, don't just fall that's into huge. the trap he of- said, Matt, he said practice, not random clinics and stuff. Watch your own practices, right? Yeah. Cause, <laughs> cause you know, we fall into the, the trap of, oh, I was there. So I watched it. Well, you might've not seen every single thing that happened or something you saw that you thought happened one way might've happened actually a different way. Yeah. So just like watching a game film, we all probably watch our games after we, you know, but watch practice. Cause again, you have more practices throughout the course of a season than you do games by far. So watch your practices. Um, you know, if you're somebody that like is very detailed and wants to take, takes a lot of notes, keeps a notebook or a journal, like write down, jot down things that you see from practice. And again, there's a lot of work that we as support staff and aspiring coaches do that might never make it out of our notebook. It might not never make it out of our brain into the space, right? Assistance as well. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 You got to pick and choose a little bit. Yeah. (laughs) Right. So, but, but if you don't have it, like if coach, if a coach ever said, Hey, Matt, what did you think about practice yesterday? I want to, I don't want to be like, uh, yeah, you know, like, right. I want to be like, oh, well, actually glad that you asked me and then be able to have some notes. Or if you ask me an idea about something, I want to have it ready. So um, that helps me grow. So the stats is a great way. It's a cheating. It's a cheat code for me to get to rewatch all the practices and and really have a pulse of like, okay, I thought uh, Matt had a great practice today. He actually didn't because he shot terribly. I just saw the couple that I saw looked really good. So puts it in perspective. But I think big picture. you know, a great way to, uh, you know, we talked about trust, earning trust with your coaching staff and stuff like that. You have to start by earning the trust of them that they know you're the director of operations, right? And so in order for me to, to move forward into a place where I can try to step into more of the basketball space, I need them to know fully that I'm 110% committed to being the best ops guy. Because when you start tiptoeing back and forth, now you're not getting your job done here. And that's what I'm hired to do. I don't, they don't care if I can recruit, if I have great relationships, they don't care if I know how to draw up a baseline OB, like why didn't you do the expense report when you had to do it? Like that's your job, right? So making sure you do your job first, then additional time, again, that, that hour in the morning, that hour at night before I go to bed, that's when I'm trying to better myself. And, and then I think as time goes on, when you develop relationships with their, with their coaching staff, with your players, you can now, again, ask questions if you feel comfortable. Hey, coach, like on that action, is he supposed to really flash up to the top of the key or is it more kind of like free throw line? You know, and then they'll right, be like, OK. Right. And, and so you're asking even honestly, little secret, even if you know the answer, you still ask because <laughs> everybody wants to teach. Right. Some, and they yeah. want to. Yeah. And they want to be able to say, whoa, you know, this is why we do it. And you say, OK, wow, that's incredible. I didn't know that. <laughs> um, so you got to kind of, you know, yeah, feed yeah. The ego, but, um, but asking questions is a great, the best for me, I love asking questions. Um, so being able to do that is a great way to learn. And then again, once you've shown you're good at your job, um, you can then add value in other areas. It could be helping with scouting reports. It could be, um, you know, talking to coaches one-on-one in their office, you know, just shooting the breeze with them. And then all of a sudden it's like, Hey, like, I saw that we, you know, we're, we're getting close to offering this kid. Like what, what is it about his game that, you know, we really like, and you're learning stuff. And then the next time it could be a week later, it could be a year later when you have an opportunity to be like, Hey, you know, I saw this kid and he reminds me of that guy. Remember we talked about him and like, they have similar games and that coach can be like, Oh yeah, yeah. That's a good point, Matt. Like I like him. And now they, again, now it's not like, Hey, that's my kid. It's like, no, I'm giving this to you because you're the assistant and now you run with it, but it makes them look good. And, and then it makes you look good. And then again, you get more opportunities to do things like that. If you were going to hire an ops person right now, knowing everything that, you know, maybe somebody that just again, finished the GA spot, they're going to be first year in it. What are some skills, whether, you know, soft skills, hard skills that you think that they should have mastered or start working on at least maybe it's this summer. They, they, they're going to start diving into it because they want to get a job coming up whenever um, that they should have um, looking back now or something that, you know, maybe you wish that you had already known before you kind of got into the position that you are now. A uh, couple things. One, have a really good pulse on your campus, the, the buildings that are on your campus, okay. the, the, the secret spots that are on your campus, the things that will, you'll want people to see when they come visit. 
um, the things that your, your players like to do, the places they like to eat, the places they like to hang out, like have a really good pulse, be the expert on your campus. Um, so then anytime somebody wants to come and, and, you know, and they say, Hey, I want to come visit Yale. It's the, maybe it's not a player we're recruiting, but the coach would be like, Hey, I don't have, I don't have time right now, Matt, can you show this guy around campus? And you're like, yes, for sure. How long you want me to take? Like, you know, yeah. and you know, all the places to go. So like being an expert on your campus is really important. Know the people like for me, um, it's very, very important that I know everyone in our athletic department. Like, and, and it's, you know, I'm not going to know every single person, but I'm making the effort to meet people, new people that come in, not just the AD, uh, like everybody knows the AD and the associate, but like the equipment person, the assistant equipment person, the coaches on other teams, like, so make sure you know them and then make sure you can have a conversation with them. And, and again, it's, it's great for me personally, but it builds the rapport of Yale men's basketball because I'm always interacting with other people in our athletic department and on campus too, professors, the people that work at those restaurants that our players love to go to. Like yeah. it's all, it's all, it's all mutually beneficial because, you know, you're building good relationships and also you're building a good brand recognition for your program. Right. So all these things are really important. Um, so I think that's one thing you can do. Um, you have to be extremely detail oriented. You have to be extremely organized um, you have to, um, whatever your system may be, like I probably err on the side of more OCD organization than others, but, um, it helps me get my stuff done. I've seen, are people you, that, are you a to-do list guy? Are you like got the planner, like time block? How do you, yeah, I got, I got, I got all the to-do lists. Okay. I got, you know, um, I, I write down just about everything because I know there's a lot of stuff going on. And so I want to yeah. make sure I don't forget stuff. So I write, I keep a notebook here. I've probably gone through like 12 notebooks since I've you know been here and I keep them all. Um, yeah. But to-do lists, I'm checking stuff off. Um, I'm adding stuff on all the time. So that's really important for me. It helps me stay organized. I'm a big like folders on my desktop person. I've seen some people, their desktops look like a hurricane ran through and not judging you if that's your- No, I'm anybody. actually pretty, my computer is more organized than everything else actually. So yeah. my phone so, kind of looks like that, but my, my computer- So like, good. I want to know, I want to know, okay, this is the 2022, 2023 season. Great. I'm clicking on that. Okay. Here's our travel. Here's our expenses. Here's our scheduling. Here's our recruiting, like all these different things. Right. And then I'm yeah. going to them and it's going broken down. So I'm doing a lot of that. So- but that just helps me stay on top of things I need to do. So being organized, being detail oriented are really important. Um, having an awareness of time constraints, like we talked about before, understanding, you know, if, if there's an email or a text that you need to get to right away, if it's something that can wait, um, yeah. who's sending it, who's receiving it. Um, I think, you know, as another skill, that's really important. It's something that I am not great at, but I hope to learn um, Photoshop. Uh, I just think that it's, you know, if you're somebody that's listening to this or somebody that is a young coach, it's like you've heard people tell you to do it. So like, why haven't you done it yet? <laughs> because, and I, I mean, I'm telling, talking to myself right now, but um, it's something that there's never a shortage of need for graphics for any reason, for us to promote our program, for us to send to recruits yeah. um, for, especially for that. Um, it's just to be able to be really good at, at doing something like that to express yourself visually and creatively is something that I think can add instant value to any staff that you're in, especially a smaller staff, like the ones we're a part of. Um, if you're somebody that's really good at that and you can separate yourself, your program in the way that you um, distribute information, especially graphics and video content and stuff like that, I think that's really important. So having Photoshop, um, even if you use like Canva, Canva is a great yep. uh, resource to to make an e more user friendly things similar to a Photoshop. But we'll start there, be able to create content. Um, and again, it's something that I I'll make graphics about things that nobody asked me to do, and then my, they might never see it. But every now and then, somebody might ask me, "Hey, do you have? Can you do something like this?" I'm like, "Boom! I already got it, ready right. to go." Um, so. Yeah. I think those are, those are some things. The last thing I would say is your communication is extremely important. You know, it's kind of a broad thing, but like one thing that I'm learning um, is that not everybody is on my time schedule. So 
I want to send a text to somebody or an email to somebody at a certain time. And I'm not thinking about the person on the other side receiving that communication in a way where maybe I shouldn't text you at 1030 on a Sunday night. Right. But I'm in my mind, like, I need to get this done. I'm going to reach out to this person. Boom. And I'm not thinking who's receiving that. Like, why is this dude texting me at 1030 at night on a Sunday? Like I'm sleeping or I'm with my family or whatever. So like understanding right. who you're communicating with, how you're communicating with them. Um, you know, coach has given me great advice about when you get an email or a text, you know, we, we nowadays, our age, we, we send a lot of communication digitally, right? So we're reading stuff instead of talking to people. So like I might read an email completely 180 from how it was meant to be read and sent. The tone but for and whatever, yeah. for whatever reason, it makes me feel some type of way. Like, why did they put an exclamation mark here instead of a <laughs> comma? Like, what are they trying to say? And then I get, you know, in my feelings and I'm boom, I start tapping away like, well, Jen, <laughs> yeah. Jen, you know, yeah. like that. And, and it's, and then it's like, yeah. whoa. Yeah. And then you send it and you're like, oh snap. I probably should have just waited maybe a day. Right. And so oh, that's so going back to, I'm just jumping into what you said about like sending a text at 10 30 at night. And someone's like, why is this, you know, why is this guy texting? Like that really can dictate a response, right? Like it to be timely and to be aware of when you're sending things, you know, you know, coaches have got a busy day. Let's not throw this on our plate today. I'm going to wait till tomorrow. Cause the answer tomorrow might be, might be more of the outcome that we want than if I were to send it today when she's got five different things that she's worried about. Right. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I might come up to coach and practice and say, Hey coach, um, you know, for, for our pregame meal tomorrow, do you want this or that? And he's like, Matt, what the hell are you talking about right now? And I'm like, Oh, my bad. Sorry. It's just like what I was thinking of. And I thought I would check one more thing off my to-do list by asking him. He's like, no, like, don't ask. I don't want to hear this till tomorrow. Okay, great. I learned. I move forward. Other things need to get addressed right away. So it's who you're talking to, when you're talking to them, how you're talking to them. Um, are you sending an email that you're copying everybody on? You know, I've sent emails to our parents and I copied everybody and coaches like, maybe you should BCC everybody because maybe some people don't want to get a response back to everybody, or they want to keep things more private, whatever it may be. So yeah. you're just learning how to communicate better and what communication works for other people, not so much what communication works for you. Love it. Yeah. Last thing I want to touch on, you mentioned um, connecting with people all over Yale, whether you guys go out to eat, connecting with the, the waiters, whoever it is, just, just making sure that people know you so that the representation of men's basketball, all of that going into networking. I just want you to kind of riff on it. Um, Cause you are, you are the pro of building relationships, but then more importantly, maintaining relationships. So I just want to give you the floor of maybe some ways, you know, as younger coaches, if you work, you know, you feel like, Nobody knows who I am. I'm, I work at a division two, II, division three, right? And I might want to connect with, you know, a bigger time coach, which maybe is not the route to go. So I'm curious as to what your, what your thoughts are there, but then, okay, maybe you're at a clinic and you meet somebody, some ways that you've used or have gotten better at um, just staying connected with those people and adding value. So just uh, touch on the networking piece of, of, of building and maintaining relationships. Yeah, so um, it's obviously extremely important. Um, it's a, the main reason why I'm in my position right now. Um, you know, the the previous director of ops here, he and I had a relationship for several years prior. He told me, hey, I'm going to be um, stepping away from this job. I would love to have somebody to recommend to fill my role. I think you'd be great at it. Are you interested? So that's like weeks yeah. before anybody even knew this was happening. And that's how you get a lot of these jobs. So that right away. And I'm, really all the, the jobs I've made in my career outside of college have come through relationships. And so, you know, I think for a young person that is worried about trying to be seen or trying to get people to know them, um, you have to put yourself out there, right? And so just like a player, you know, that's complaining about their minutes or whatever, well, are, you got to put the work in, right? And, and sometimes you put the work in and it, and it doesn't mean that there's somebody that's just more talented, bigger, stronger, faster, that is also putting that work in and, and they're there in front of you, but you got to work to get to that point. If you stop working, you can't progress. So for me as a young coach, I put myself out there. Like I'm going to clinics, I'm going to watch practices. I'm going to watch games. There's never, there's never like this morning we were talking about earlier, there was a, a celebrity breakfast that coach Jones was speaking at. Right. And I've heard coach Jones speak a million times. I hear him speak every day in the office. Right. So I don't need to go out there. 
but I'm going to support him. And also there's a very high likelihood that he's going to introduce me to somebody that I'm going to meet, right? Or I'm going to hear other people. I might learn something. And I've never, whether it's that type of thing or going to a practice or a clinic or anything like that. Um, the Twitter spaces, all that stuff. Twitter, that you Yeah, Twitter into. spaces. Yeah, yeah. Like all of these things are an opportunity for me to learn, an opportunity for me to be seen, to meet other people. But I've never once came back from something like that and been like, that, that was stupid. That was a waste of my time. I wish I had slept in like, you know, never once. Like it's always been like, I've at least met one person that I think was really dope that I want to build a relationship with, or I'm so glad I went because I reconnected with this person who I hadn't seen in three years. And like, it was amazing. So I think you got to put yourself out there. Um, it's extremely, extremely important. And you don't need to be at a place like Yale to do that. You can be at a small school. You can be at a high school. Um, we all started somewhere and are working towards where we want to go to. So you, you find other people in the business that are similar minded that want to help bring other people along with them and you, and you gravitate towards those people. So, you know, I was lucky to have the opportunity to coach at the prep school level and high school level for four years. And so through that, I met a ton of assistant coaches because we had a lot of players on our team that were getting recruited. Right. And so to your second part of how do you, you know, get those relationships and then how do you like develop them and, and grow them? It was about my desire and interest to meet these people and to stay connected to these people. And so it was every college coach, no matter if it was John Calipari, Roy Williams, or, um, uh, Greg Fahey, who's at Siena now, he was a D3 assistant coach at the time. They're all getting a handwritten thank you letter from me. Again, it's me helping myself, but it's also me helping the players that are trying to get recruited. It's me helping Vermont Academy or Windward School program to create that relationship. So it, it helps everybody. And, you know, so every single coach that came in the gym got a, got a letter. Um, those that responded to me, either text or writ wrote back or email back. Now I have a contact. So now I can develop that relationship. Those that didn't get back to me, I hope I get another chance to see them again, because I'm going to do the right. same thing. And I'm going right. to keep going until you show me that you're not somebody that's interested in having a relationship. And there's very few people that are, people are just busy, you know, yeah. and, and, and whatever. So follow-up is, is probably the most important thing, putting yourself out there to, to meet those people, make connections. And you have to invest in, in relationships. Like, you know, you got to spend money to go to the final four, if you can afford it, right. You got to spend money to go to these clinics. If you can afford it, you got to spend money to get in your car and get gas and food so that you can drive somewhere to go watch a practice or see a game or whatever, like work a camp, you know, working camps is incredible, you know, opportunity. And you might not make any money, you might lose money, but you never know who you're going to meet in that week or in that day that can help you. So, um, you know, one, one thing that I really like, I heard a coach told me this a while ago was it's not about building relationships. It's about building real relationships like R E A L relationships. And so it's the relationship can be transactional. A lot of the times, especially if you have, if you're a high school coach and your players are getting recruited by this college coach, as soon as that player doesn't get signed, like it's radio On to the silent. next, yeah, yeah. Or I'm at Yale University and all these young people, they, they want to ask me, oh, how did you get into ops? How did you do this? And then as soon as I become a D3 assistant coach, they're like, oh, I don't know Matt Elkin anymore. It's like, no, it's, it's about building relationships. I want to know you because I want to know your family. I want to know your journey. I want to know what matters to you. I want to know what, you know, what hurts you, like all these different things because we're all people. And then people are going to help people get jobs. People are going to help people win games. People are going to help people get, uh, provide for their families. Yeah, like, yeah. so we're all people working in a profession where we're working with other people. And so if you can do the best you can to understand other people and have connections that go deeper than just the, the team you're on, um, you know, the, the program you're with, whatever it may be like, those are so important to me. And it's, and because I was able to live in LA, live in the Midwest, live in the East coast, work at high school, work in AAU, do all these things. I put myself out there. I was able to make relationships, relationships, and I was able to follow up with those people and maintain those relationships and grow. And I have so many seeds planted at a young age that the only way they can go from here is up. And so to have that opportunity as a young coach, which all of all young coaches have, 
you, you, your age is your benefit. So start planting those seeds and, and don't be too quick to, to pick the fruit, right? Let it, let it grow, let it grow, let it grow. And when you need it, or when you don't know you need it, that's when it'll be there for you. So good, Matt. So good. I'm going to get you out of here on quick hitters. I got four like rapid fire for you. Um, first one, are you a podcast guy or a book? One or the other, what do you got? Podcasts. Recommendation. Give me, give me, uh, give me three. Um, I like ESPN daily. Okay. I like, uh, slapping glass. Yeah. And I like, um, oh, what's it, what's it, how, how things are made. I think it's yeah. called. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really cool. So, so they, they just like talk about random stuff and it's like fascinating. Okay. Favorite city to live in. You've Boston. Been, you've lived in a lot. You said Boston. Boston. That was quick. No, no competition there. Like without it's a doubt. Not, Boston is, I, I mean, you might be able to sense the bias sees coming through, but it's the best city for sports. It's the best city for uh, food. It's the best city for college history. Uh, you got the water. Um, it's just, and it's Enough my said. home. Yeah. I, it's my home. You were so confident in that. Yeah. Overrated or underrated, the Ivy League playoff format. Overrated or underrated? Wow, that's a loaded question. Um, I'm curious. I would, I would say <laughs> it's, I would say it's overrated. I don't know Fine. who's rating it though. It depends who's rating it. But uh, <laughs> from your opinion, do you like? I, do you like it or do you not like it? Overrated, underrated. Well, I will, I will say, no, this is quick hitters. But um, yeah, you're good. This it's, this it's year we on. won, we won the regular season Ivy League championship, and. Uh, in the years past before the tournament happened, winning the regular season was all that mattered because that's who went to go to the NCAA yeah. tournament. And that's what everybody wants to do. So, you know, when you're as lucky as we are to have reached that point, you know, a lot recently, that's all we want to do is go to the NCAA tournament. So this year we won the regular season and we didn't really celebrate at all because all we wanted to do was win those two games to get to the yep. NCAA tournament. And when we lost to Princeton, who had an incredible run in the NCAA tournament, when we lost to those guys, it felt like our season was a failure. And it was like that shock of like, wait, we don't get to go to the NCAA tournament. I'm like, guys, you, you lost one out of two games and you won the, you won four, you were the best team for 14 games. I know you, you can't like, so as, as time goes on, people will realize, okay, regular season, it's a great deal. I know we went to the NIT instead of NCAA, but like, so the format is um Tough. it's great because it gives more teams a chance to re to, to have that incredible feeling that really high emotion um but it it minimizes and it takes away from everything that happens before that um and so that's why um it's it's tough it's a tough uh thing but it's great it's great it's it's cool to have op opportunities to get to the tournament biggest tip for an ops person going on the road recruiting for the first time because i know you just went recruiting fairly recently i believe Yes. Um, snacks and water. That's, that's my, that's my feel. You got to feel, you got to feel yourself. There's a, it's, it's very easy to get stressed out, especially your first time, especially if you're ops, because you're trying to do everything for everybody else. You're trying to watch three kids at once. It's stressful. Like you, you physically cannot do it if you're not drinking water and you're not having some food in your stomach. So for me personally, having some snacks and water is really important. I could, you can look at my thread. You'll see a bunch of other ones, but <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll, we'll link your, we'll link your Twitter. We'll twink, we'll link your Twitter in the, in the right, bio cool. below. Get you out of here on this one. What are you doing this off season to make sure that you're getting better? Uh, maybe something that you do every year in the off season, again, to continue to improve to make sure you're not coming back exactly the same. What skills, what kind of things are you going to be looking to do this off season? Yeah, so one thing we talked about it already about going to practices, but because for the Ivy League, we don't have any um, off-season workouts in the summertime, um, we lo I lose that kind of zest for being around the team and, and being at practices. And I yeah. always love going to watch practices, even if it's the same coach that I've known or worked for or whatever. But um, so every off-season, um, I'll try to go see some practices, some local practices. If I'm on the road, I'll reach out to somebody and see um, so that's, that's something that I hope to do. Um, and then 
you know, every year I hope to continue to grow as a coach and move closer to becoming an assistant coach. So, um, you know, trying to work with our assistants and ask them what are some things they're working on because everybody's working on something and see if there's a way that I can help them in a small way. So if somebody's saying, hey, I'm looking at doing, you know, implementing more five out actions into our offense next year. Okay, great. Can I help gather some film for you? Can I help break down stuff? So trying to help our assistants to help them do their jobs better, that'll help. That'll trickle down to me and help me learn a little bit about what they're doing to be an assistant as an assistant so that I can hopefully prepare myself to get there for the next step. Matt, this has been awesome. The insight has been uh, obviously a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of knowledge. So I appreciate you making the time. Thank you. I appreciate it. Glad to be here.